The Core 360 belt is the best aid to train the abdominal wall. The Core 360 is a patent pending, first of its kind training belt that helps you move, breathe, and perform better. We use the Core 360 belt with almost every patient at Winchester Spine and Sport. The biofeedback is second to none, and it's an amazing way to teach proper respiration and can be even used during higher level movements in the gym. Teaching proper respiration is about as fun as a rash, but with the Core 360 belt, you take all the headaches away. Visit core360belt.com and use the code GESTALT for 10% all off all belts. Ohm track sensors not included. Again, visit core360, C-O-R-E 360belt.com and use the code GESTALT for 10% off. Enjoy the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, we are at the Gray Institute here in Adrian, Michigan. So, uh, Gary, you need no introduction, but thank you for having us in oh, your, your humble abode. It's a joy um, to have you here. Uh, I, I got to give a special shout out to uh, the AV guys here at the Gray Institute for letting us use their space and uh, their audio and video. And so we're, we're super thankful. The, the quality is going to be a lot better than what it usually yeah, is. So yeah. we're, we're helpful. Don't be spoiled that. by the quality. Right, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, I need to, to introduce everybody here. So uh, all the way to the right. Brian Rafool, who is a Gray Fellow. So uh, you've gone through the gift program, which we're going to get into. Obviously, Gary Gray, Brett Winchester, Taylor Premier. So Gary, I uh, I need to start off with um, my first introduction to you was through Brett Winchester. So I'm going to show you uh, one of our slides, or this is the slide that Brett has basically had in every single PowerPoint he's ever done since I've seen him. I think I've seen enough. Uh, this was kind of the introduction to Gary Gray uh, for the chiropractic world, and uh, obviously we learned about drivers and triplanar and how important all that kind of stuff is, which we're going to dive into. But I just want to kind of start off with, uh, you know, what does this quote mean to you? And then maybe let's just start off by defining function. To you. Maybe I'll read it that yeah, way. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, specific motions at certain segments of the kinetic chain have a dramatic effect in movement of other joints or lack thereof in the turning on or off of certain muscles. You said this in a seminar in O'Hare Airport, Marriott. That was in 2005. And I think that's a great jump off point of, I mean, because you are basically now, Gary, you are considered the father of function. And uh, I know as humble as you are, you would never, you know, promote that or anything like that. But that is what you're known as. So how did you earn that, uh, that nickname, if you will, do you think? <laughs> We're getting old. <laughs> you, you hang around long enough and uh, all of a sudden, and you, and you share, uh, hopefully from your heart, and people kind of call you the father of something. So, uh, But it is kind of fun to kind of be known as that, but there's uh, a lot of people that have contributed to that understanding. Um, but as far as the quote, the first thing that hit me is how honored I am that you were kind enough to put it in a presentation. That, that's uh -huh. the first thing that was like, you know, when you when you kind of say something, you're not really sure how it's getting across to people. And uh, when they're kind enough to go, hey, this kind of makes sense. And I, you have, you're an amazing teacher and you impact thousands of people. And to know that you just took the time to say, I'm just going to put this quote down because it seems like certain joints can influence other joints. And that's part of what we need to understand about human movement. And I think the one thing that, you know, always sticks out to me, and you made this because I'd never heard it this way. And you were talking about the lower extremity. You basically said, you know, the subtalar joint, if the tail is 80 ducts internally rotates, it's going to drive internal rotation of the tibia. It's going to drive internal rotation of the femur. And then with that, we have turning on eccentrically of the glutes. And your point was basically, if you don't have calcaneal evers, and then you don't have turning on of the glutes. And I never heard it connected the way that you had connected mm -hmm. there. So back way back when, what, you know, because since you're kind of the pioneer in it, how did you start thinking about all of these, like, really kind of uh, new thoughts that no one else was talking about? What, what got, what was the edifice of that, would you say? Yeah, I don't want to sound dorky, but uh, a lot of it was just because I, I knew how ignorant I was. Um, I knew a big part of my job coming out as a physical therapist, and then I quickly became an athletic trainer, and then I became a strength coach, and then I took some personal training degrees. And as you know, uh, I went to a zillion chiropractic seminars, and I went to podiatry seminars, and I just quickly realized I didn't know anything about human movement. Zero. Nada. Uh, and I thought, that's strange. Every patient that walks to the door wants to move better. And that's kind of a weird sense when you go, my job is to get them to move better, but I know nothing about human movement. Um, and 
as I would go to a lot of the courses and see people who were specialties in the back and people who really understood the foot really well and people kind of that were the knee gurus, uh, it became very obvious that everything's connected. Uh, and so I started back in the late 70s in a pursuit to say, and you just said it beautifully, um, if that foot happens to do that and that talus happens to do what you just said, and it would do that to the lower leg and it would do that to the femur, then when we see an EMG, when that foot hits the ground, we see kind of this transverse plane motion of the glutes being turned on. Well, what turned it on? And you just said it brilliantly, it's calcaneal eversion that makes the talus do that, that creates, as that quote says, the kinetic chain or what we now call the chain reaction. And so we, we're still doing that. We're still looking at something and going, oh my, uh, Doug and I just had a great time this morning. We're putting together all the transformational zone information, kinetic chain information on throwing. And so when you load to throw, what, what's happening? Uh, and then when you explode, what happened? And when you load again to decelerate, what's happening? Uh, and it's obvious that there's so many joints that impact other joints, especially if you can find a joint like the hip that impacts the shoulder to the elbow. If I can get the hip better, then I can take the shoulder pain away from the thrower and I can take the elbow pain away from the thrower. So uh, it's still something we don't understand uh, extremely well because there's so much that goes on but we're starting to get a hankering because it's starting to consistently when we see that move that moves or when we see that move that moves and if you can start to understand the chain reaction you can go I know you're hurting but I know that guy wasn't moving the way he should and therefore I think he's probably a big part of your cause right and I know another unique thought of yours is the utilization of mass momentum mm -hmm. gravity ground reactive forces in all those motions that we just talked about are essentially happening for free, as you always say. Beautiful. So um, in saying that, I think that's another misconception is that like, you know, if you said, well, what is causing calcaneal eversion at heel strike? Well, most people, you know, in a classroom is going to say, well, the proneus longus sure. or something like that. And the reality of it is like that is not at all how the muscle is actually functioning. So I think that's also another good thing that I would like to ask you about is when did you start reconsidering basically muscles are doing the opposite ironically of what everyone's being taught you know taught how they function yeah that's um i'm not sure i can go back to a specific time i know it was the late 70s um but i was trained just like a lot of people were trained how muscles function on a table we would call that context dependent and at least you go back into the uh, history of physical therapy a lot of what we did back in uh, let's say 40s 50s and 60s uh, was with respect to neurological diseases um, and we needed to see what the kid could do on a table what muscles he or she could activate and so we came up with this idea um, that if you kind of position them and you're able to do this and get that muscle to contract based on the origin and assertion that's what the muscle did and so we then wrote textbooks to say well, the function of that muscle is to do that. Well, they should add just a little phrase on a table. Uh, because then you said the brilliant thing, as soon as you get up and you're not on a table, gravity's influencing you in a whole different way. Uh, the, you said it very properly. The ground reaction force is influencing you a different way. Your body's already moving, so you have massive momentum that you have to control. So now everything's totally different. And in many times, like you said, uh, it's the opposite. So we're taught that the hamstrings flex the knee. If I stand up, gravity's gonna flex my knee. And, and interestingly enough, the hamstring extends the knee. It actually takes the tibia and doesn't let it go further forward. So it brings it back, not only in the sagittal plane, but in the transverse and in the frontal plane. So just like you said, laying down, yep, hamstring does flex the knee, but I've, most of the people that I deal with want to know how their body's functioning when they're functioning, not right. when they're sleeping. Yeah. And you always, the example you used to give would be like, you know, if you were going to reach up and you're going to put like a bowl or plate into your cupboard, well, you're not just, you know, in complete isolation as you do that. And right. I thought that makes such perfect sense because if you just, next time you're putting something in your cupboard, you will notice that there's a wanting of the body to actually move. Yep. And I think, you know, that's what helps spares our joints and our muscles because right. we're not just functioning in pure isolation. Yeah, I, I don't think you can say it better than that. I think uh, sometimes um, due to just habit, due to 
input to our brain or due to a certain type of training or being on certain pieces of equipment or just a lot of things, I think we groove a certain plane of motion and we beat ourselves up. Right. And one of the things we know for anybody, we can dissipate that force by getting every joint to contribute uh, and every muscle to contribute. So it's not just like hitting my head in one spot. It's every time I do something, it's so I don't get a headache. And so I, I think that's a big deal. That's what we're really trying to understand now. Right. Uh, on the preventative end. What can we do early on, even with kids, to make sure, uh, even now you get commercials, um, hey, thought about your first new total hip? Well, you might want to be thinking about this one, or commercials yeah, right. on, <laughs> hey, you need some medicine to make your arthritis feel better? Uh, you might want to consider this one, or hey, you, about time you get that total knee done, don't you think? You know, And it's like, wait a minute, I don't think that's necessary. Uh, if we know how to train the body and dissipate the force, like you said, so it's not being grooved. Right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing you're kind of a pioneer in is basically describing human movement in triplanar motion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have obviously the sagittal coronal and the transverse plane. And your overall reaching thought, I think, in your system is that we want to we want to give the body an opportunity to be able to move at the end range of these three planes of motion. And if we're able to do that, the proprioceptors in our joints and our muscles are able to give information back to our brain as far as stabilization, movement, or yeah. however you want to say it. Yeah. Again, uh, I, I know we were giggling as we were kind of preparing for this, but I and um, but you have a, an amazing way to explain things. So uh, if I, I don't want to no, re-explain it to, to, to make it. No, no, no. <laughs> no. But I'm. I mean, you explain it better than I do, so I don't want to mess it up uh, by trying to re-explain it. Uh, but um, you know, we all learn, and you know, in our kinesiology books and chiropractic medicine and physical medicine and physical therapy, we see this guy standing with the three planes cut through him, and it, it very clearly says we all move in three planes of motion. But then the rest of the book is all sagittal plane. The rest of training is all sagittal plane. The rest of muscle function is all sagittal plane. And luckily. Because of ignorance, I remember in 1976, I go, I have no idea what I'm doing, so I'm going to do a shotgun approach. And so instead of just making the shoulder work straight up or in the sagittal yeah. plane, I said, uh, one of these better work. So I went back, I went to the right, went to the left, I rotated right, rotated to the left, and we called it a matrix. Right. And we just said, if you're going to do something, you might as well do it in three planes of motion. Right. So how do you reconcile then, if we're just talking about like a rotational sport, let's say golf. Mm -hmm. Golf, we know the top 1,000 players in the world, they move very well in the transverse plane. And they actually don't move, you know, that much, you know, in the coronal plane. We don't really want them to be sliding through the hitting zone. Yes. So how do you reconcile the triplanar thought process like in that example? Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a great question because that's thrown us off for years. Um, when, you, when you see movement, uh, movement can be rotation or translation. And you just gave a great example. If I take my club back uh, and I don't have the rotation where I should have it in the frontal plane, in the sagittal plane, trying to move in the transverse plane, I will slide to get it. I'll compensate. And that's what you see a very typical average golfer. We will we'll slide and they'll say, no, I don't want that frontal plane motion. No, you don't want frontal plane translation. You want frontal plane rotation. So what of the... Let, let's use my right hip of a right-handed golfer. If It's easy to see as I take the club back, I'm getting rotation of the right hip. What we don't see as well is the rotation of the right hip, not the, not the translation, but the gliding of the bone, where I get adduction of the hip, and then we don't see that really, really nice subtle flexion. Uh, and so we think, well, that's all rotation. No, it, that good rotation can't happen without the flexion and the adduction. And then if you talk to the butt muscle, the cannon of the golf swing, it's going to say, ooh, I want to be lengthened in the sagittal plane. Not through, like you say, sliding my butt back, right. but rotation. So uh, the difference between rotating at a joint or a segment translating, causing rotation at a joint, still confuses us. But that's kind of how we, how we rectify that. There's, we haven't seen anything of any significance, including you know, hitting a tennis ball, uh, throwing a baseball, hitting a golf ball, punching somebody in the nose, or walking that wasn't primarily transverse plane, if you really look at it, but has to be complemented beautifully by the right kind of sagittal and frontal plane motion. Well, I think you could even take like a microscopic view to your point. Like if you're looking at C0, C1 joint, although it's, you know, dominated in the sagittal plane, right. there's still some coronal plane and transverse plane motion there. Exactly. So, I mean, even though it's known as a joint that moves in the sagittal plane, there's still, which kind of sounds a little bit like a... 
the knee joint, maybe. Yeah. You know. Yeah. The, it, it, uh, you know, CZOC one is a great example because it's a it's a sagittal plane, yes and no. You know, yes joint. Right. But if you really look at it, it's impossible to just do pure you know, plane, even though it's trying. And right. then, of course, then you go down to C1, C2. Now we're going, you know, that's the, you know, no joint. And then we have the I don't know joint at C2, C3. But when you look at them, they all have complements. A, a great example is the ankle joint. The ankle, when you look at the mortise, it's got a lot of sagittal plane, not a lot of rotation going on in there, not a lot of uh, transverse plane motion or frontal plane motion, but it's got to be there to give you the adequate sagittal plane motion. And your best example, I think, is the knee, because we all learned the knee is a hidden joint. It's far from it. It, it. it rotates more than we ever dreamed, and we want it to drive in the frontal plane, because that's what loads the butt and the foot. And so... What we're trying to do, and again, I, like I said, we're far from it, but we're trying to, is we're trying to get like what proportional amount of the motion in each plane should be there for that activity. So in some cases, like in golf swing, I want maximal hip internal rotation, but I probably only want 50% of what I'm able to do with hip A deduction and maybe only 10% of hip flexion. So I know if I have that, I'm going to really be able to load my butt. So we're looking at not only the different planes of motion, but for a specific activity at a specific joint, what ideally is the proportional amount of motion that I want to, con to combine in order to make the golf swing good, so to speak. Wow, that's rich. That's um, the, the most underrated thing I think that exists in all of your work is functional manual reaction. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the ankle mortise before. I oftentimes use, I mean, I will, you know, uh, split stance the patient there and do what you taught us to do with functional manual reaction. And if you didn't believe there was transverse motion at the ankle, you can feel it there. Oh, sure. You know, you can feel the posterior rotation of the fibula. Yeah. I mean, all of those motions like that, you can just close your eyes, put your hands on the lower extremity, and you can feel all these motions occurring. Yeah, and that's why I, I believe um, the chiropractic profession, when they start to get a hankering of, of what, we're, what we've been trying to do, uh, they get it instantaneously because you're used to grabbing you're things used to palpating, yeah. and you, your sense, you have a great sense of what's going on and you want optimal uh, motion at joints and you know how joints are connected from the spine all the way down to the big toe, all the way to the thumb. And so the beautiful thing about AFS, uh, as Brian has even taught me, is, hey, this is second nature to us right. as chiropractors. You're not you, you haven't taught me anything new. He, I mean, if he was really honest with you, in his 40 weeks of gift, we didn't tell him one thing new. Now, we might have enhanced something he already knew, but I guarantee you we didn't teach him anything new. We just took what's already happening in your profession and making it better. Yeah. The, the great coupling, I think, is uh, I, I thought I was decent at palpation, but when I got deep into the transitions, both splitting it up into a rotation and a translation, holy smokes, I thought my eyes aren't that bad, they're horrible. <laughs> when I put my hands on that hip and I feel it, through those two planes, through translation and rotation, and all six uh, transitions, I'm amazed at what you can feel and find. A whole new world, yeah. It's a whole new world. Uh -huh. And that is eye-opening, because the whole point to me is um, people are chasing pain. Talk about a frustrating practice and a miserable That's life. That's a road to nowhere. That's a road to nowhere, right? We've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so this is so fun. Now they come in, and I listen kind of what their pain is, but I don't really care. <laughs> where do you, function, yeah. That's it, I'm just looking for motion. I'm, where do you move well, where are you successful? That is, I think, one of the greatest things of their system. My natural inclination would go, go where they don't move. He doesn't. Where are you successful? Right. Where are we gonna build off of? Yeah. Which is so cool. And that's kind of how he lives his life, I think, in a lot of ways I, too. I remember you know? when he was a gift fellow, he's kind enough to send me a patient, uh, his chart. And I, I started jumping up and down because I've never seen anybody articulate the total human movement and extrapolate what he needs to extrapolate. And then the, his game plan was to build upon those successful movements, go into those planes that weren't as successful, use a little bit of rotation and translation to facilitate that using the gift of his hands, which is the most powerful gift I think we have to, because the body will follow a path of least yeah, resistance unless we can coerce it to go somewhere else. So, um, Again, it was like, whoa, I wish, I wish I would get it this quick and this, this kind of understanding. Because it's ultimately, Chase, you know, uh, we always have to ask ourselves, so who pissed the part off? You know, who caused the pain? You know, Who's especially low back, shoulders, knees. 
I can almost guarantee you it has nothing to do with the low back shoulders or knees, you know, so uh, that's been fun in our practice, uh, being able to take people who uh, maybe had somebody that says, well, if you have low back pain, we're going to do a lot of low back stuff on you and go, well, yeah, let's just for fun, let's look somewhere else. So that's really chain reaction biomechanics is having confidence looking somewhere else. Yeah. I love it. Well, that was a great, uh, great intro. Awesome. I know you got loaded a bunch of questions. Let's let's pull back a little bit. Let's give a little intro into the Gray Institute, into uh, 3D maps, and then let's kind of start talking assessment. Because I think the first part of this, I really want to dive deeper into the assessment before we get into the fun stuff with the treatment and stuff. Yeah. So let, let's kind of talk about uh, the transition between the applied functional science and then into these 3D maps. So you kind of identified 66 movements, right? And then have broken it down into six tests that are you you feel have kind of encompassed all of those movements yes. so where did that transition happen uh, it was relatively you know not too long ago even though you've yes. been studying this for a long time yeah so. no uh yeah it's embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> so, so um and a lot of it happened uh when uh i brought doug on because when i brought doug on he got out of college one of the first things he said is i know you guys are in a movement but you don't have a nomenclature for movement so you guys talk but you don't talk about movement because you don't you can't describe three-dimensional movement and I thought well that's kind of interesting and he says just for fun dad stand up and do a movement in front of 100 therapists and see if they describe it all the same and my next seminar I did I got up and I just said okay uh, I'm going to do a movement so I'm going to start kind of here naturally I'm going to do a movement and then I'm going to come back and just write on a piece of paper exactly what I just did 100 different definitions okay so that'd be like being zoologist and an elephant walks in the room and you go, oh, what a cute little mouse, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, and I, when the mouse poops, it's not going to be no big deal. Well, it's an elephant. When it poops, it's going to be a big deal. So our nomenclature was bad. So once we kind of got a hankering of that, then we said, well, for years we've been following these principles, but we never really wrote the principles down and said, we believe, like you said, it's driven by gravity, ground reaction force, and mass momentum. It's three-dimensional. It's a chain reaction. It's subconscious. It's all the things that we didn't make up. I wish we did, but we weren't bright enough. But we just said people smarter than us tell us that this is how the human body moves. And then based on that, what we did is we said if this is the truth and we're going to look at a what we would call a movement screen, we want our screen to reflect the truth. We don't want to just come up with a bunch of movements that we go, well, we've done that for 40 years, so we might as well do it again. Um, and then before, excuse me, before we did that, we said, well, there's, as you just said, Taylor, there's 66 motions in the body that influence other parts. It's a perfect uh, adjunct to that quote. There's certain, like if I do this, my subtalar joint doesn't move. So right now I'm not interested in what the thumb's doing, okay? But if I do this, even sitting here, my foot's moving. Okay, my butt's moving, my knee moves. So this is an important joint. So we took all the, what we call vital joints of the body, wrote down exactly what you just said, that six degrees of freedom. There's 66 motions. And of course, first of all, we did, we got, found out what was out there, what other people were doing. And we found out that most of them were only getting five or six of those motions. I'm thinking, that's kind of like sending you in, uh, if you had a headache uh, for a, a brain scan and telling you, well, our scanner's only gonna look at 5% of your brain, I hope we find the tumor. It's like, yeah, that didn't sound good enough to me. And so when Doug and I got into a room, and obviously all this was complemented by all the information the Gift Fellows gave us, and obviously Dr. Dave Tiberio and all the influences, we finally said there's got to be authentic movements with authentic drivers that anybody can do that will show us the full range of motion of all 66 motions, and then even more importantly, can I control those motions, or mo what is what you call it, mobility and stability. And that was the uh, start of 3D maps. Now, was that also the way, because you kind of have uh, um, a legendary reputation to be able to see things with your eyes. So was that like, a, I guess, an epiphany moment when you were starting to say, well, not everyone may be gifted with, you know, what they can see with their eyes in human movement, but this at least allows us to kind of, put a roadmap to everything that we're, yeah, we're trying to do. Yeah, except I think it was just the opposite, though, because I, I was around a lot of people like yourselves that would see things with their eyes, and I'd go, crap, I don't see it. Honestly, I wouldn't see it. I'd go to SI courses. I wouldn't feel what they were feeling. They'd say the pelvis is doing this, the sacrum's doing that. I'm sorry. I don't see it. And they'd say the foot's doing this, and I'd go. So I think the epiphany was I had to make it so I could figure it out. I had to make it so I could go, well, of course, look at that, you know. 
as soon as they're doing that, that heel comes up way early. That's, that's easy to see. I mean, it's not that, that, that difficult. So a big part of it was that. The other part was uh, we preached for years that we don't think there's, there's such thing as a total body movement screen. Uh, I always said that you had to know the thing that they wanted to do. So uh, golf is a great example. I would preach that, you know, if you're going to train a look at a golfer, you got to look at the combination of motion. So if I'm taking at this backside right hip, I got to know that flexion we just talked about, rotation as opposed to translation, and that full internal rotation to, to the point where now I'm so internally rotated, my femur starts to externally rotate. But that three combination happens at every joint in my body with golf. So my contention was, you got to you got to put them in a transformational zone of the activity that they're going to tell you they want to do to effectively evaluate them. I was half right. Um, the key is when it's combined like that. I don't know who's zooming who. So we kind of said, well, kind of that's the truth. But in reality, it'd be better to see: Do I have hip flexion? Do I have hip adduction? And do I have hip internal rotation by the pure planes? And then from that foundation, then I can layer on the multiple plane. When we uh, train the U.S. Navy SEALs, my whole theory went to pot because the question is, so what does a SEAL do? Everything. <laughs> so, so now what transformational zone am I going to use? You know, what are you going to do when you wake up on a rock in Afghanistan? Well, I don't know if I'm going to run, shoot, punch, haul, you know, stay still, uh, but you have to prepare me for everything. Right. And that's when we go, wait a minute, everything means out of those 66 motions, I got to make sure that I create maximal motion in all 66 of those motions to, as you properly put, uh, facilitate the proprioceptors to make sure all the muscles are activated. So in a very short period of time, this gentleman can go out and protect us. And right. so that's kind of like, whoa, that's starting to make sense to us. So it was literally a 45 year journey to go. Uh, and if we had to do it over, it'd probably take 45 years again, because you had to learn the principles and the truth before you came up with the thing. Too many people, including myself, try to come up with a thing and then try to justify it. Right. And sometimes that doesn't work. Right. Yeah. I think it's fascinating, too. I mean, we're talking about uh, a theme of golf here. And, like, somebody might not know that in the backswing, they need to be able to keep their right foot, if it's a right-handed golfer, in a little bit of eversion. And if you're able to do that, I mean, the top 1,000 players do this in the world, you literally feel everything in the post of your hip kind of turn on. But, like, so, I mean, there's a lot of people that if you're learning how to play golf, if you knew that, that might make you a little oh. bit better of a golfer. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that, that's to me, is a perfect example. Um, Harvey Pennick was probably, without a doubt, one of the best golf coaches in the world. He would never tell you how to swing the club, but he would give you hints just like you just said. So if he would see somebody, which is all of us, okay, when we're learning how to play golf, stand up, and again, I'm a right-handed golfer, and I'm taking my club back, if he would see that foot roll out to the outside, he would realize you just lost your power. Because yep. now the femur's rotating, and I don't get good internal rotation, so I'm not, turning, I'm not lengthening my butt, my cannon. So he would just simply say, pretend there's a bug underneath the inside of your heel. And if you don't keep pressure on that bug, when you take a club back, it's going to come up and bite your ankle and it has poison. It's going to kill you. And you're going, well, I don't want to be dead. You know, so <laughs> you kind of go there. And as soon as you went back, you don't think about a swing thought. You just, I'm going to keep pressure on the inside of my heel. And you said it perfectly. I'm still going to invert a little bit, but you said I'm going to stay everted. And that leads, allows me to load. And just that little hint changes the life of golfers right out of the gate. Now, the beautiful thing is, if you know that about every joint in the golfer's body, you can give them hint after hint after hint and hint and make them better because we're just a human body swinging a stick. And if we're not swinging it well, it ain't because I have a bad golf coach. It's because my body doesn't know how to swing the stick. So it's a, it's a body fault, not a swing fault, we would call it. But that's right. a, now the, the cool thing is we're doing a, a very similar biomechanical transformational zone analysis of pitching. And the first thing you notice with a pitcher, so if I'm a big right-handed pitcher, what do I do when I go out in the mound? Well, they have a rubber. I'm going, hmm, cool. And I don't just look at the rubber. I do this. I start digging in. Okay, I make a hole. Why do I make a hole? So my foot stays everted more. Very good, just like you say. So now when I go here, my foot not only doesn't invert, it stays everted. In fact, it everts a little bit because it's on. So now I got bottom up, turning my butt on, top down, turning my butt on. We got what we would then call a butt load, okay? And that's what pitchers need. They need a triplane butt load because you want to throw with your butt. You don't want to throw with your shoulder. So it's kind of neat, that little hint of the golf when we... Now, so it sounds like if we're golfers, we should take 
a rubber mound out there and for everything. It's illegal. <laughs> you, can, you can't. You can't even put if a little you could, wedge. You would. In. Yeah, you can't put a wedge there. Now, there's a shoe company that put a little wedge in the forefoot of the shoe. Kind of smart. Scandalous. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, but, but it's so significant that if you would happen to, even on a golf course, say, well, you know, kind of like an unlevel lie, if you dig just a little bit of eversion thing, Stroke penalty instantly as soon as, you, as soon as they see that foot digging in or if you just even put like a clump of grass on the outside of your foot because it's that much of an advantage. Wow. Yeah. Well, and I mean, honestly, that's we always say that hitters in uh, Major League Baseball, they're like uh, literally cats playing in, you know, sand pits. They get up there and the hitters are actually trying to do the same thing, too. Exactly. So they're they're pitching their in a right handed batter, their yeah. right foot and a little bit of eversion just to be able to load. Yeah, they, yeah. You, you know, you see this at the first inning a Major League ball field. You know, it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. First, first guy comes out there. He's going <laughs> to dig yeah. his hole. Next guy's going to come out there and dig his hole. Yeah. And then, of course, the. The, the places we played, they already had huge holes. You know, we, yeah, just, right. we had to just look around for a hole that wasn't too big and we wouldn't fall in. So that's kind of, but it's neat when you, as you just very effectively did, correlate those little nuances to, so why does that work and biomechanically, what does that mean to us? Well, I think like the innately great athletes, like they pop out of the womb and they just know how to do this from the beginning. But there's almost like a second opportunity if they have someone like yourself in their life to be like point this out where they still potentially could be the best golfer in the world, even if they weren't before. And that's where like we have such a neat job because like we can really, you know, take that on. I think it's uh, yeah. it's, it's called action, if you will. Yeah. No, it's, uh, you know, it's, there's no doubt uh, there are certain people that have certain gifts. Our job is to take whatever your gifts are and enhance them. Exploit them, yeah. And I, lo I love the word exploit them. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm never going to make it on the pro tour, but I want to be as good as golfers I can be. Yeah. And so I just want somebody to treat me with that same respect they would a pro athlete. And every kid just desires that. They don't, you know, just because I can't run fast and jump high doesn't mean I'm worthless. Right. Take the gifts that you see let me show you how I move and they give me the right advice so I can move better and you can uplift me and you can engage me and encourage me and empower me uh, because that's that's what our job is. That's what we get to do. Love it. Uh, so do we want to get a look at what these six tests would potentially yeah, yeah kind of can we demo that? Would we right here? Students? Yeah. It'd be wonderful. Yeah. Okay, Let's awesome. Let's get it on. I'll be the demo. I'll be, I'll be the, the Why don't instructor. you be my uh, you you're my athlete. I love it. All right. Okay. So the the interesting thing is and again I should have him do it. Because he, he does, uh, I mean, he does a brilliant job, but what I'm impressed with is how well he documents it. Because when I got done reading about his patient, I could see his patient, and I never saw his patient. I mean, I visually could tell you who his patient was. That's kind of the sign of a great evaluation. Oh, gosh. If you document it, and I can go pick that person out of a crowd of 100, <laughs> that's a good evaluation. <laughs> that's good. Okay? That's kind of a litmus test. Right. Uh, another litmus test is... Uh, uh, I was at a seminar and I, I told a little bit of this story early on where this uh, young lady didn't really like what I was talking about and she didn't like the fact that I was kind of picking on uh, a movement screen that she learned versus kind of the movement screen that I believe in uh, and then didn't want any part of it or me but I convinced her to come to our lab uh, and she came I didn't think she'd come and she went through all the what we call 3D maps but then all the tweaks that you add to it which ultimately be is, is over a million uh, but we went through enough for two hours and then she came up uh, afterwards and um, she says, well, uh, you win. And I go, I'm not sure what we win. She goes, well, before I told you I was really upset, you know, that you kind of made me think about if I'm doing something really functionally. She goes, I got to thinking. Um, and, and what we do at the end of our seminar is we take 3D maps and we put it to music. It's really cool. You actually look like you could dance. She goes, I got to thinking <laughs> if you can't dance to the movement screen. It's not functional. So if you're doing a movement screen, whatever you call it, and there's a lot of just staticness to it, and it doesn't look like it's a, it's a choreographed dance, mm -hmm. it's probably not functional. And I thought that was brilliant. I said, oh, sweet, I'm going to steal that. Yeah. So what we all did, but this is what Doug and I did, we started with the power sword, power, and we started with the hip. We said, let's, let's, let's not go 66 motions right now. Uh, which is 11 joints. Let's just start and make it easy on us. There's two big ones staring at us. And so we know at the minimum for anything, for walking, for golf, for throwing, for dancing, for enjoying life, I got to have extension. I got to have flexion. I got to have adduction. I got to have abduction. I got to have internal rotation. I got to have external rotation. No brainer. Okay. But the real question is, 
Do you just want to know if they have it, or do you want to know the maximum amount they can actually facilitate? You want to know maximum amount. You want to know what, how much mobility they have. So the first thing we did, and you can kind of just mirror me if you want. Okay. I'm going to step forward with my left foot. You step forward with your right foot. Yeah. So the first thing we did is if we step forward, does that extend your left hip? And your left hip does. But it looks like it has more to go. Okay, so we would say, well, let's go out a little further, and you go out a little further, and even go further, and then, interestingly enough, your heels still didn't come off the ground. We go, well, we got to come at it from a different angle. So we know authentically in real life, walking will extend your hip, but bring your feet back, okay? Take your hands, just take them over your head. Now go way back now, and now I'm extending your hip again. I'm going, well, that's pretty cool. I can extend your hip with your hands, or I can extend your hip with your foot, or I can even, hey, Look behind you. Okay, I can extend it with your eyes. So if I use all three of those drivers together, what I would have you do, Taylor, is just simply go, just kind of sneak out with your right foot and then take your hands up. And every time, just go a little further and just kind of look up and just kind of just keep moving. Boom, bingo, your right heel come off the ground. So now I've used it up because the thing that raises the heel is not the soleus, it's the hip flexor. So when you get to use up all your hip extension, the only thing left your body can do is raise the heel. Okay, because then that allows the hip to come flex and kind of slack again. So we go, well, that was pretty easy. We just, that was kind of almost too easy. Uh, what about flexion? Well, now it gets easier. It's probably just the opposite, you know. So, so the hard part was, is when I went down into flexion, I took my foot back. I go, well, I can do a posterior lunge, but I don't fully flex my hip. So I'm not getting maximum amount. But then when I came here and I went down to the ground, I'm going, whoa, now I'm getting close because my chest is almost on my thigh. And now if I do the lunge and put my hands down here, I can't go any further. So it's so go ahead and do that. Just do a posterior lunge and just take your hands down to the ground. And now, now I have maximal flexion. So I'm going, I like that because you'd be surprised how many people don't have that much flexion. They're moving pretty good, but they just can't get that much flexion out of their hip. We thought, well, let's keep going. So we use a foot driver, we use a hand driver. Uh, so let's go frontal plane. So frontal plane's really easy. We'll both face the camera here. You take your right foot and just go here, come back home. And so if we looked at the left hip, it's going through abduction, okay? But I can go way far out, my foot's still kind of on the ground. So I'm going, put your hands over your head. So if I go basically this way, foot's going the wrong way, if I go this way, my foot and my hip are going to abduction. So that's what I want. Yeah. So Doug says, well, lunge right, reach left. Okay. So take your hands here, lunge right, reach left. Okay, go out a further each time, come back, go out a little further each time. And now I got the lateral border of your foot coming up. So I know I've used it up. So now functionally, I've used up all of your left hip abduction. Okay. It gets even easier. Let's just do the opposite. So taking my right foot across here, that's adduction. But am I using up all my adduction? Well, not right now I'm not because my foot's not coming off the ground. But if I add reaching as you just did, Taylor, to the other side and gradually go a little further, there you go. Your medial border of your foot just snuck off the ground. So I know I've used up functionally all of your hip adduction. Pretty happy with myself. So we've done sagittal plane. Huh? Frontal plane, but as you know, our favorite is the transverse plane. Right. So transverse plane, you go, well, how about external rotation? I go here, that's pretty good. But then if I add my hands to it, I can get it to the point where my foot's going to spin. So I'm going to just get to it, and then I go, oh, look at it. The foot's coming off the ground, and sometimes it just still spin. Beautiful. So I've just used up all of your external rotation, and now probably the, maybe the most important motion in the body, the thing that really loads the butt in the transverse plane is internal rotation. So now we come around the corner here, take our hands in that same direction, and all of a sudden, if you go far enough, you're going to constantly see your patient or client do that, which is good. That means they're working hard. Very good. And you see that reaction of your foot. So if we, if we took our graph and we looked at hip and it said flexion, extension, ab and adduction, internal and external rotation, maximal amount of mobility, we'd circle those. So we have six out of 66 already. We kind of, it was pretty it. good. Yeah, yeah, crushed it. But then what became even more fun is when we went down to the ankle, we had ankle dorsiflexion. We had ankle plantar flexion. We had subtalar joint inversion and eversion and ab and adduction. So those six were covered. And then if you go to the joint in, in the middle, the knee, we wanted flexion, which is obviously posterior chain. We wanted extension, which is anterior chain. We wanted abduction, same side lateral chain, adduction, opposite side lateral, external rotation, and internal rotation, the six motions of the knee. And they're, they're pretty significant. 
then we go, well, well, crap, this is almost too easy. I wonder what we're doing with the spine, lumbar spine, thoracic, and cervical. And as soon as you see what the hands are doing, obviously I got full extension, I got full flexion, lateral flexion right, lateral flexion left, rotation right, rotation left, got no other choices. And then the only thing left was, am I getting flexion of the shoulder, extension of the shoulder, horizontal abduction and adduction of the shoulder, and I'm getting pure ab and pure adduction of the shoulder, yes. So we go, wait a minute, we just circled all 66 motions. That's when we went, Okay, we're on to something. Because if I can only have you do six movements and you expose to me the 66 motions that you have, how your body utilizes those motions, I have a big head start on how does Taylor move? What's his giftedness? What is he like? But then we go, but can you control the motion? And all you do with that is you go from mobility to more stability. To get there, you just take away stability. And so the obvious stability for hip extension here, in fact, you, you'll actually feel it with hip flexion. So let's just do our posterior chain. Take your right foot back and do this, okay? Now go down to the ground. And you'll notice when you get down to the ground, you're putting a lot of weight back on your right foot, okay? So even though your posterior chain, your butt, your hamstring, your calf, your posterior fascia, uh, thoracolumbar fascia, rectus are doing a lot of deceleration, the thing that's really helping you is the lunging leg. So we thought, well, this might be easier than we thought. So instead of going that back, just toe touch. So now what you do is just go back and toe touch and come back. So go, just go ahead and just do that toe touch and go, oh, now I feel it really in my butt. And now we'll tell you, don't toe touch. Just take your foot back and don't touch. Okay, now see how well you control it. We give you a few times to do that. New ball game. Okay, so you had good mobility, but depends on looking right or left, I'd give you a few more chances. You're a little bit sketchy when I get into the transformational zone. So that's good. You're successful at it, but there's, I can really improve that quickly today, probably not by going into the sagittal plane. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to look at the other planes to see what adds to the posterior butt. Sure. And so we simply said, well, all we have to do with all the movements now is go from, toe, from, from lunge to toe touch to no toe touch. Guess what? Now I have stability of all the joints, even the shoulder. Uh, and then we go, wait a minute, 66 mobility, 66 stability, those are the 130, 132 things we wanted. We just got 100% of them. And we were actually, we wanted 50%. We were yeah. going to be happy because <laughs> we knew the other screens got 5% or 10%. So we literally came out of where, where we just were in our, our boardroom, literally flying out of there because we'd been in there for way too long, you know, a few weeks trying to figure this out. Now, when you hear it, you go, you guys are stupid. <laughs> If it took you that long to figure out something, because when you see it, it's like, well, duh, of course that would give you that, and that's mobility and stability. But as you can see, but what other people have done before us, so it's not that much, well, duh, it's kind of like, that's pretty cool. So right. that's how we came up with it. Well, simplicity, we keep coming back to it. I, I think at the end of the day, like, simplicity, simplicity is complex, but it's also so, it's just nice. It There's fits. brilliance in yeah. simplicity. Yeah, and then, anybody can make something complex. Yeah, well, and I can do that in a heartbeat. I, I can take something really simple and make it so bad that uh, no one understands it. And so, uh, obviously, because of the gift fellows, and because of Dave, and, and because of Doug, and uh, because of the input of our gift fellows, they forced us to say, yeah, you can, you can sound really intelligent by throwing all that complex crap at us, but make it so I can use it in my clinic real quick. And that's, that's again, I, I, uh, hopefully we have every profession listening to your podcast because i think what you guys have to offer anybody who's a movement specialist should be listening yeah. but in the chiropractic world nothing better than watching somebody move putting them on the table doing a technique knowing that man t7 t8 that's just not moving at all and i'm getting that to move i go down l5s1 get a little rotation i go up there i get a little thoracic motion stand somebody back up and dramatically the whole movement pattern like instantly gets we know they feel better but it's even better to go, now look at you move. And they go, look at me, look at I, I can tell I'm moving better. They know they're lunging and reaching better. It's an immediate feedback. And at that time, I can say, hey, I'm proud of you. Yeah. Oh, you, Brett, you did a great job. And they're going, well, shoot, wait a minute. Well, you're the one that just fixed me. I'm proud of you. Well, well let's be proud of each other. Uh, because it gives us, at the end of the day, physical therapy, athletic training, uh, performance training, strength and conditioning, chiropractic, it doesn't matter. It, the common denominator is we want people to move better. Right. And that's, now, that's it. spoiler alert for the next uh, potential segment would be 
Uh, you used to say, and I don't know if you still say this, like <laughs> once, we, once we've gathered our information, mm -hmm. now we're going to attack success, which, which is a little bit different than most people think. They'd say, well, Taylor was the worst in this plane of motion, and, yep. and so therefore that's what I want to go after. But I think you're going to tell a different story. Yes, um, and that because we thought of it. Uh, years ago, uh, the behavioral scientist said people like to be successful. And if you beat on their lack of success, you're not going to be as successful than if you understand what makes them successful. So a big thing that we've done over the years is to say, um, if I'm a little queasy, and we'll use, it, we'll use it as an example here. We'll see if it works, okay? So if you're a little queasy in your posterior chain, we would go, okay, the posterior chain, especially at the butt, also, the butt also controls adduction. Okay, and it also controls internal rotation. So if I saw you queasy there, I'd be going, okay, I'm going to take you through the frontal plane real quick, and I'm going to take you through the transverse plane. And if I saw one of those planes a little better, as you just said, I'm going to tweak that plane. Okay, if I do my job halfway right, when you then go back to the posterior chain, you're going to be a lot better without working on the posterior chain. That's when eyes light up. Like, wait a minute, a couple of minutes ago I was all over the place. And now I just did a bunch of other things, and now I came back to that, and now I'm so much better. What did you do to me? And you're saying, well, I used pr the proprioceptors to turn on the same muscles that control that in a little different plane of motion. I tweaked it a little bit, and so you're a lot better. And that's where the fun of understanding the biomechanics comes in is because we can then say, well, um, that pattern when successful feeds that pattern. And if that pattern is not successful, I can, I can use that patterning, that sensory input, that sensory integration that you guys talk about so effectively. And I'll use that and I'll get about 95% of that sensory integration, that proprioceptive coordination. Then when you go over here, you're successful again. And it's like, well, how did you, did I get stronger in 10 minutes? No. Okay, did I, no. You just turn on more light switches. You know, the, the room's lighter and you got more proprioceptors telling your body what to do and all of a sudden you can do something you didn't do 10 minutes ago. And that's, the, that's the, I think, the fun of AFS is you see clients and patients all of a sudden do something they couldn't do 15 minutes ago and now it's like, well, what, was that fun? The, you know? Yeah, one of the great gifts I think that the uh, Gray Institute gave me was, I look at people There's different. a pun there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Uh, was buffer zones. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at people. Mm -hmm. How can I gift him with greater buffer zones? So if we're talking the golf swing, if you take the novice and say, show me your backswing, as Gary says, show me transverse plane, can they go anymore? They don't have another degree to give you. Exactly. Lateral flexion, they have nothing. Mm -hmm. But if you take a pro and he did that and swings 10,000 times a week, he would be broken so fast. Yep. So he's got to have another 15 degrees on that transverse plane, front plane, plane. Then you would go to him, do that exact same swing on a single leg. I'm gonna take your other support away. Oh, no problem. The novice would be all over the road. Mm -hmm. If you don't have both, you don't own. Yep. You don't own. Yeah, buff, buff, so. Buffer zone is, uh, it, I think we've underrated that. I, I think, uh, I have actually uh, gave a seminar uh, a week and a half ago, and I said, we're, the next two days, we're just gonna talk about buffer zones. Because I said, if somebody, let's say somebody has an ACL injury and they have to rehab, I said, if you do nothing to them, okay, they'll go from, I just got out of surgery to doing pretty good. Okay, do nothing. Let them go home for six months and let them just walk around the house. You know, the, the body has this amazing way to heal. Now, great practitioners will get you to, okay, I'm, I'm back to as close to normal as possible. But the doctor of fools of the world, world will t build a buffer zone. They'll, and that, this takes a lot of strategy to go from what you used to be able to do to what I want you to be able to do now. Because when you get back out on the court and you do the exact same thing that tore your ACL, and this time I want your body to say, been there, done that, no big deal. And you never knew you were even close to tearing your ACL because you don't. Same thing with that golfer. You give them that buffer zone, now they're swinging within margins that they're not beating the end ranges of other their body up and they go i can't believe it i played 36 holes the other day and i i, I wouldn't even dreamed i could do that because before it would hurt my back so buffer zones is a big deal uh it's it's kind of the frontier that we're trying to understand even better because buffer zones theoretically could be danger zones because i'm taking you beyond what you're ever going to have to do in the court last thing i want to do is put you in a buffer zone and re-tear your acl so i gotta be bright enough to go well, if I'm going to enter in the buffer zone, I got to make sure every step I take that I know that next step is safe. Because the mistake I've made is the next step wasn't safe. Right. So don't, don't, I don't want to do that. Right. Yeah.
Well, I think too, like uh, appreciating like the closed kinematic system that the body is. And I think you've really exposed how we can, you know, run our, our patient through a set of tests or a matrix, if you will. And we can really kind of expose like what the key link is. And you've, you know, real creatively put your words together over the years with terms like peltruncula, mm -hmm. which is basically, you know, the, the combination of looking at what the pelvis, the trunk and the scapula would be doing, right. you know, uh, in unison, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what, uh, what was your first play on words and you know, what made you do that and, and what's made first, it all stick? First, well, that's a good question. The bad news is I make words up. Um, <laughs> and I, I used to do it to be cute. Okay, I have to be. I have to admit, it. but now we do it if there's not another word to describe it. Right. So we'll we'll say, um, if you really want to understand shoulder biomechanics, you have to understand we added a us to it. Peltruncularis. So the pelvis, the trunk, the scapula, and the humerus. So if I know what those segments are doing, when you throw a fisbee, I'll know what the shoulder's doing, and then I'll know how to rehab it. Strange enough, it looks nothing like rotator cuff exercises. <laughs> looks nothing like tradition, um, and so mobility and stability well everything's mobility everything's stability you know walking is a combination of mobility and stability what is it well we obviously came up with most stability uh, I think the, the one of the best ones we made up uh, is and this uh, this this is a total can of worms um, but we finally found out that muscles function not eccentrically or concentrically or isometric that muscles during function have this amazing ability to function eccentrically and concentrically at the exact same time. And so now what do you call that? Well, econcentric. And strangely enough, the root word of econcentric is economy. And that's what the muscle's trying to do, be very economical. So when we teach muscle function, we teach how the muscle gets loaded, but during the explosion, it still gets loaded in a certain plane or certain joint eccentrically in order to produce a concentric force. Well, that's magic. Because if I know what that motion is to keep it eccentrically going, I can create more power in those other two planes of motion. If I don't know that eccentric power, then I'll miss it. So that's yeah. like a big, that new, I would call that the, we're, we're studying that every day because uh, obviously it's not in the books anywhere. Uh, but what you have to do is you have to watch something move and go, okay, uh, um, you, would you, you want me to give you an example real quick? Would that be helpful? Uh, the, the, the easiest example is walking with your butt. Okay, so if you're listening to the podcast, first of all, we appreciate that. And you know, obviously you care a lot about your patients and clients. But we know when the foot hits the ground, and you said it perfectly, gravity causes all kinds of stuff to happen. Calcaneal inversion, mid-tarsal joint inversion, mid-tarsal joint abduction, mid-tarsal joint uh, uh, dorsiflexion uh, creates knee flexion, knee abduction, knee internal rotation, hip adduction, hip flexion, uh, you know, hip internal rotation, all caused by gravity. And you said it even better, bottom up, it's that talus diving in off that calcaneus, it's really internally rotating the hip. So what's fun about that is, as soon as my butt feels that, muscles don't know if it's going to function eccentric or concentric, they just know when they're being turned on by a proprioceptor. And then they go, now that I'm contracting, what's happening? Well, am I decelerating motion or am I accelerating motion? Given a choice, 100% of muscles will like to decelerate because it's a nice buildup. Okay, it's a nice load, just like pulling back a slingshot. You don't, you don't want to start with just the slingshot fully loaded and it wants to load and explode. So what happens is, we have that internal rotation that loads my butt in the transverse plane. Flexion of the hip caused by gravity loads it in the sagittal plane. And adduction, which is caused by gravity, loads it in the frontal plane. So all three glutes and the gemellus and uh, the piriformis and obturators and all those guys back there, they all go, whoo, this is pretty cool. And the goal is don't let Gary fall. He's walking. Okay, so decelerate Gary going from the ground. And then it ultimately says, once you do that, then let Gary bring his other leg through because he wants to walk. He wants to go somewhere. So we're going from double leg support to now single leg support. When I go to single leg support, what's cool is these big glute muscles go from being lengthened in the flexion into order to extend me. Very powerful. If they take this adduction, which my body weight went to the right, and now it's grabbing it. It's throwing me to my other foot, which is abduction. Interesting enough, as my foot comes through, my hip's going through more internal rotation, which means now my glute's being lengthened even more in the transverse plane. So as soon as this is happening, my glute goes, I'm getting long in the transverse plane in order to be more powerful in the sagittal and frontal. Well, thinking about body weight and walking, 
That's a pretty economical way to walk. But if I walk, and as you said, I don't have good subtalar joint eversion, and I don't get good internal rotation, people are kind of what they call an apropulsive gait. They don't have good hip extension, and they don't get from one side to the other. They're, they're kind of a wishy-washy walker. Uh, then a lot of people will go, well, you're going to have to concentrate on contracting your glutes. <laughs> and we go, no, probably not the best first thing to do. What we would do is say, why aren't they contracting? And the reason they're not contracting and not powerful is you don't have a good enough internal rotation. You'd see that real quick. You'd do this and you see that, hit, that go like this, go do that again. You'd go, no problem. I'm going to give you a little more hip internal rotation. Let's go do that same thing. And all of a sudden now you have more power on the sagittal and in the frontal plane. Kind of fun. Bad news is every muscle functions that way. So in function, you can throw all the muscle books away. Well, in function, ironically, yeah. in the gait cycle in human walking or locomotion, the glutes aren't active when the hip's extending. I mean, exactly. ironically, and that, that's what you're taught in school. So basically, yeah. we need hip extension to eccentrically, you know, lengthen our muscles in you three planes it. of motion. That's what's going to initiate our swing and resupinate our foot. And the, you got it. Yeah, so yeah. That, it, it's just it amazing, now. isn't it, like how yeah. integrated the whole system yeah. is. The, the fun part about is... Um, the research has been out there for years, thousands, I mean, hundreds of years. Like, I can go to a gate book right now and show you what I just said through EMG activity. Basman and DeLuca. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, did, they weren't lying. They just stuck the electrodes on there and watch you walk, and everybody had that same thing. Yeah. Our job is to say, and why did it do that? Right. And how do I get to do it better? That's, that's our job. Can I, and who's not contributing where it's not doing that better? Well, you're going, well, hey, I know, some Taylor joint. Well, if you didn't know the relationship to subtalar joint in the hip, you'd never even think of the foot causing the lack of internal rotation of the hip and winding the iliopsoas up to give me good propulsion through swing phase. So it's, you, you got to kind of know your chain reaction biomechanics before you can start putting the pieces together. Right. It, it, I mean, the whole idea is kind of fun, and that's why I think the chiropractic profession does so well with this is because you're trained that day one. Everything's connected. We're gonna we're gonna treat you here, and you're gonna get an effect you're here. You're giving us way too much credit. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, that's yeah. true. I mean, because that's that's your training. Yeah, right. Where we weren't, where we were trained very isolated. This is a, a day for the shoulder. We're just gonna do shoulder exercises. We're gonna do the shoulder. The shoulder's going, but my best friend is my opposite side hip, and the opposite side hip. But my best friend is my foot. And so, yes, yeah, shoulder, I know I'm a best friend, but really, you're probably your best friend is the opposite side foot. And then the million dollar question is, so what does my right shoulder and my left foot do together? Right. And the answer is everything. Yeah. Uh, good segue as we wrap up this section. I think, you know, the juxtaposition of words that uh, I love the most of yours is most stability, mm -hmm. which is a combination of motion and stability. Right. So... I think why that's so important is because a lot of times in physical therapy or chiropractic or rehabilitation, we are using very artificial positions to train our, our patients in. Right. So you kind of coined the term, which is going to be a nice segue into what we're about to do, which is just because a segment is moving doesn't mean it's not being stabilized, hence the term most stability. Bingo. Yeah. In fact, I, I think um, I was misled. I just might have been confused. But back in the day, I thought stability was the lack of motion. You know, so if you had a stable low back, you, your low back didn't move. And, and, but in functional, functional stability means motion at the right time, at the right plane, and, and the right amount at the, for the right reason. Mm -hmm. So it's a control of movement that stability is, where we are taught, well, if you could stand still and, and balance, you're stable. No, nah, that's not stability. Stability is almost losing your balance, decelerating, coming back home. That's stability. And so I was misled because I thought stable was something like a, a stable rock on the ground. It didn't move. Okay, that's stable. Where in the human body, stability means movement under control. So it's a whole different thought process. Beautiful. Well, I think we covered basically everything on the assessment. I think uh, we wanted to. Probably not, but uh, good little segue. So we're going to cut it right now. Uh, we're going to come back after a little break here, and we're going to finish with treatment. So uh, great job, guys. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.